Now, Shiraz, do you say your last name? Tangri. Tangri. And there are speakers tonight on the um, LA downtown streetcar. Um, so, depending on who wants to go first, um, what we're going to do after you do the presentation is if you'll be, you know, we have the agenda. We'll ask questions if you want us to throw up questions. And if you want to talk about parklets, too, I think some people will be interested in it. So, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm Councilmember Jose Weizar, and thank you, Bart, for the invitation. Thank you for your advocacy for public transit and for transit in general. Uh, I want to thank all of you as well for taking the interest in transit. I am uh, not only a council member for the City of LA, I'm also a board member for Metro. I've been on there for about two and a half years. I'm the, the mayor. Uh, and um, I'm excited about the prospects of bringing back these streetcars to downtown LA. Uh, not only for nostalgia reasons, uh, as I talk to people about this project, people mention that they or parents or their grandparents all rode the streetcar at one point or another. In the city of LA, it's unfortunate that we no longer have them except a little extension in San Pedro. Um, but before I go on and speak about um, uh, the streetcar, uh, Parklets, just to mention that, to talk a little bit about that, uh, recently the city of LA approved a pilot project to allow us to build four Parklets uh, in, uh, they all happen to be in my district, in the city of LA. Now, as Bart mentioned, it is where we take a public space and typically a a two uh, parking spaces and we convert it into public space and we allow the community to say what they would like to see in that public space. It could either be benches and trees, a place for people to come sit down and enjoy a cup of coffee. In downtown some people are, asking, are advocating for exercise equipment and what's neat about this is that it's not only going to uh, provide a place to build community uh, but it also helps local businesses as people get to walk around and it's really encouraging more pedestrian use of our neighborhoods. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we haven't done enough of this. Uh, I went to New York uh, about two months ago. It was my first time there in 15 years. And in Manhattan, you would find that many of their public spaces are taken up by parklets or some form of uh, beautification. They put up planters, benches, chairs. And I think that's a great way to build community, make neighborhoods safe. And the city of LA is actually a little bit behind the ball in making this possible compared to our, our counterparts like San Francisco who are much further ahead in this than we are. Um, I'm excited about this because the four pockets happen to be in my district. Uh, I started an initiative uh, a few years ago in El Sereno uh, and in Highland Park where we were looking at Huntington Drive and York Boulevard and we set off on a uh, uh, vision for those two streets. How do we improve those uh, those two corridors, commercial corridors, and improve them for the local neighborhoods. We enlisted uh, the Green LA Coalition, Living Streets uh, Coalition, and uh, we came up with these parklets concepts. York Boulevard as well in Highland Park, if we have the first ever bike corral in the city of LA. Bike corral is the same concept, but we put parking spaces for bikes. It was a huge success in, in York Boulevard, and we're hoping to expand that to other parts of the city. Interestingly enough, uh, it was my constituents in Northeast LA that were advocating for the parklets. And at the same time, with Russ and others here in downtown LA on Spring Street, they were kind of advocating for the same thing too. So we brought them all together. We're going to do these four pilot uh, parklets in six months. We're going to come back uh, and see, uh, get some input, uh, see how they're working, and uh, perhaps expand them to other areas. So thanks, Russ and others in downtown, for your work on that. And uh, I think it's a great thing. Hopefully, we're on to something good. And on the streetcar, I was mentioning how it's not only good for nostalgia, people love it, people love the concept, but it's not only a great transportation system, but as we've seen in other cities, it's a great economic development driver. And as we're looking at downtown and some of the revitalization that is occurring, um, it, we certainly think that's going to help with a lot of that economic development activity and revitalization that we hope to get. Now, how I got involved with this is six years ago when I was, when I was elected as a council member, I was elected to represent a portion of downtown and Broadway. It's like this one, just a Broadway corridor. And one of the ideas, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to uh, improve that corridor. We have 12 historic theaters in that one corridor uh, with beautiful buildings uh, all around it, uh, all around uh, that, that corridor. And as we were looking for ways to improve it, we set up a Bringing Back Broadway initiative which Russ is a board member, and we uh, set out on several things uh, that we could do to improve it from improving legislation, 
uh, to getting a streetscape plan, uh, doing uh, more adaptive reuse for the upper floors of those beautiful buildings. There's about a million square feet of available space in the upper floors to a plan to revitalize some of these historic theaters. And a key component to that was to bring back the streetcar for the reasons I mentioned. Not only to connect downtown, but also to drive the economic development revitalization that we need on Broadway. Now at that time, six years ago, a conversation about bringing back the streetcar was in different parts of downtown. The Central City Association was talking about it. There was another group that was mentioning it. That was, we had some money for feasibility studies. Uh, but we strategically wanted to bring those conversations under one platform, and we brought it under the platform of the Bringing Back Broadway Initiative. And from there, we explored what other cities had done to get their streetcar back, and we looked at Portland in particular, where they set up a nonprofit and had them do the advocacy and the initial planning for their streetcar. We did the same street thing here. We started LA Streetcar Inc., which Shiraz is a member of, and uh, he'll speak to you more about that right now. But like Portland, we anticipate that the one in LA will be a huge success. I mean, we look at the demand figures, uh, AECOM did a study, and our uh, projections are that we will have more demand for the LA streetcar than probably any other city that has developed their streetcar already. Um, we are in the phase where we are completing our environmental review. Uh, we recently passed in council uh, the uh, ability for us to move forward to do a community assessment. So every, within a three block radius of the line, we will ask the voters, registered voters, they would want to have the properties assessed for, um, for us to build the street. <coughs> we hope to realize about $62 million should that assessment pass. This is going to happen in November. We, and then we will apply for some federal money to fill the gap of a total of $125 million that we anticipate it would cost us to build a streetcar. The initial money that came in for this was $10 million of seed money from the Community Redevelopment Agency. And so critical for us is, one, that passage in November of the, uh, the assessment, and two, after that apply for federal funding, which we think we would be in a very good position once we complete our environmentals and have that local matching. Uh, funds to go with it. Now the route, uh, Sherelle will t speak to you a little bit more about that, but essentially what we hope to accomplish is to connect the different neighborhoods in downtown. The backbone or the spine is Broadway, it will then go up to LA Live, come back over to some of the cultural museums that we have, such as Walt Disney, to the Civic Center, and back up Broadway and form this connectivity. I predict that uh, we will have a huge success for this, that we would want to continue to do phase two and move beyond that. Uh, but for now, that's all we could afford, <laughs> number one. And, and, uh, and two, in order for us to get something off the ground, uh, we thought we'd start with this uh, portion first. So other than that, I just want to give a brief overview of how this started, how we got this movie back in LA. A um, little bit about the route, but uh, Shiraz will give you a bit more details about it. And uh, I'll give anybody a quarter who recognizes. No, no, I'm going to lose. You guys going to answer this one. There's someone other than me in this video that you re recognize, so look out for him. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so uh, Shiraz is an active board member. I want to thank him for all the time and effort he's put into this. Uh, he's an attorney with uh, Alston Bird. Um, and uh, he has put a number of hours into this, so I want to thank you for your work. And I thank Russ as well for his work in helping us get to the point we are in the street. Thank you, Councilmember. Can everybody hear me? I, I usually I save my yelling for my children, so I'm going to use the mic. Um, first off, thank you for the hospitality. Um, I hope that every Trans Coalition meeting always serves Subway food. It's just too perfect to, uh, to not do. Um, I, you know, we, we didn't get a chance to kind of introduce ourselves. I think you probably all know the, the council member a little bit. I'll, I'll mention my kind of transit interest or background, um, and, and I'll, there'll be a little more as we talk about streetcar, but I moved to LA. I was a East Coast transplant. I primarily grew up in and around New York City. Um, and when I moved here in 1999 to downtown, I didn't have a driver's license. So I very quickly discovered in 1999 what the transit system was here and what it was not. Uh, my wife and I are probably the only um, fools who ever took the treacherous pedestrian journey from Bunker Hill all the way to Chinatown um, and never did it again. Um, and uh, even 
I, I think even in 1999, um, downtown obviously wasn't then what it is now, but there were lots of destinations within downtown that were fascinating. Um, the markets, the financial center, the museums, cultural places, um, and getting around them as a pedestrian um, was, was always challenging. Um, now, even as the rest of downtown is filled in, and in fact as there are more destinations around downtown, the need for connectivity I think has only increased, not decreased with all that development. So it's been uh, really a pleasure to work on the streetcar project. Um, I, I have gotten to work on some really interesting projects in downtown and, and elsewhere, including um, the Grand Avenue project with the newly open Civic Park. Um, and to me, there, this project, the streetcar, is the most important project that's going. I won't say it too loudly when my AG friends are around, but I think it's more important than the football stadium to be candid for the, for the uh, life of the city. Um, I'm going to play this video, and then because you guys are such an educated crowd, I'm going to blaze through uh, some basic info about the, the streetcar project, because I really want to have time for questions, and I, I think the, the council member will be available for a little bit for questions as well. So um, there are some fun cameos in here. Conductor number one and starts the operation of the new streamlined streetcars at Los Angeles. The latest in big town transportation on rail. between all of our neighborhoods. 
you know, to allow each neighborhood to still function on its own and have its own rich and, and interesting character, but to be very well connected and easily accessible to the other neighborhoods. We're really quite familiar with Los Angeles, but I don't think anybody down there has any idea of what the impact is going to be with the streetcar in time together in various downtown neighborhoods. I mean, it's, it's going to be really significant. But where streetcars really start to separate and differentiate themselves is their economic development potential. It's those rails that go on the ground that we talk about that is a permanence factor that allows investors and owners of properties and businesses to want to invest in that area. What the street park also brings is it's a driver for economic development. Uh, Broadway itself needs to be revitalized. And as we saw in Portland, wherever that streetcar went, those areas were developed. The streetcar is going to deliver thousands of people to the sidewalks of downtown LA. Thousands of people that would otherwise be in their cars, driving by, not looking at the businesses, not stopping at the storefronts. So if you're a block, two, three, even four blocks away, it's going to be, it's going to be a huge benefit to you. If we sit here and languish for another decade and blow these kinds of opportunities, we're just going to sit here with dead real estate. The bottom line is it's about time that Los Angeles acts like a major world-class city. And I think the streetcar is really going to help us do that. It's good for the environment, it's good for neighborhoods, it's good for people. We had it right 50 years ago when streetcars ruled the day. People liked them, people used them, and they worked. The time for the streetcar is now, and it's coming upon all of us to work together. Government can't do it alone, and that's why it's the private sector and the public sector that will make the streetcar happen again. As I said, what I'll do is go through this very quickly, but I have just a couple points to emphasize about who, who, who we are and what we're bringing. Um, GoLAStreetcar.org is our, is our website for the nonprofit LA Streetcar Inc. Um, that was formed about four years ago now to essentially bring together the private sector. Um, as alluded to in the video, this is truly a public-private partnership project. Um, and obviously, anytime you're dealing with transit, you are, you're working in the public realm, you're working with a public operator in all likelihood. Uh, but for folks downtown that have kept the streetcar dream alive for decades, um, really since the system started uh, being pulled apart, um, the private sector involvement was huge. And the economic development aspects of it, I think that the folks that own property and have invested in downtown wanted to make sure that this project was developed in a way that really leverages all the private investment that has been going into downtown now for the last um, couple of decades. So, you're an educated crowd. Um, it's a streetcar, it runs in traffic. Um, I think of, you know, people always refer to trolleys and they talk about um, the, 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 the sort of retro systems or the ill systems they used to be. The great thing about modern streetcars is, as you can see from this picture, you know, they, they run on the curb, they're low floor vehicles. Fantastic for people with disabilities, for people with strollers, bicycles, um, to get on and off easily. You just roll on, roll off. Uh, modern streetcars tend to run on the curb, not in the center of the street. If you see old photographs of downtown with the old systems, you, you'll see you know, pedestrians walking through lanes of traffic to get to the streetcar in the middle lane. Traffic these days doesn't move the way it did in the 40s and 50s. Um, so curb running is really the way we're going to go. Uh, it's a walk extender. Um, there are, uh, you know, downtown has great. Uh, downtown certainly has connectivity issues, um, and one of the great things we think the project will do is get folks that are already within downtown. There's a half million people here every day, um, working here as well as visitors, and um, and you know, typically kind of working only in their part of town. I've I've worked on on and around Bunker Hill uh, since 1999, and uh, you know, the vast majority of people I work with. Uh, eat lunch every day in the same place in Bunker Hill or within a half mile radius. Um, same thing for other parts of downtown. People tend to stay to their own part. We know that streetcars help people get around and really discover the city that they're, that they're in. Uh, and then the transit connector side. Um, as you'll see when we show the map, 
there's a tremendous effort made to make sure that we were really tapping into the existing and the planned transit for, for downtown. So the regional connector, the blue line, the expo line, um, there are overlapping connections, as well as to the bus systems that exist. Operates on the right of way, if the streetcar isn't there, a bus, um, a bike uh, could go, an ordinary passenger vehicle can go right in that same right of way. It makes it much faster to build these systems, you don't have right of way acquisition issues. Uh, and in a dense urban environment, unless you're going underground, like the regional connector, um, probably this is the only kind of a system that you're ever going to get into a truly built out environment. You may remember from a couple of years ago, we had uh, sort of a get to know us uh, advertising campaign where we paired up some of the different concepts and, and things that people associate with different parts of downtown, um, City Hall, um, uh, so the Civic Center represented by City Hall and Popcorn representing movies on Broadway, um, Staples Center and, and some of the nightlife that's around town. Um, and we found a lot of folks as we talked about this, particularly residents but businesses as well, really I think appreciated the connectivity aspect of this project. Um, and then the economic catalyst. When the Broadway um, initiative was, was starting to float the concept of, of <coughs> doing the streetcar, we held a conference um, on, actually, the Orpheum Theater on Broadway, and it was one of the opening events. I was talking to somebody from Seattle, actually, who um, kind of self-identified as a transit-oriented development person, and I said, oh, that's interesting. I work on some TOD projects, and he said, well, keep in mind, streetcars are not transit-oriented development. They're all about development-oriented transit. Um, these are systems that you build because of the economic impacts that you expect to come with them. It's not a regional system. It's a local connector system. It's an urban circulator. And it has to be measured accordingly. It doesn't make sense to compare it to bus rapid transit or something else that's meant to go many miles very quickly. Um, these move at the speed of traffic, and they do so so that people in the vehicles can look at the shop windows as they go by and decide if they want to step off and, and um, patronize some of the businesses. Um, we referenced some of the, the, uh, the dollars, but we did an economic development study at the beginning of 2011. Um, we made the assumption that downtown would continue to grow perhaps not at the skyrocketing rates of the last decade, but steady urban growth. And on top of that, we looked at what would streetcar bring, what would streetcar add in terms of value, and we were looking at over a billion dollars in new development. And that's within all of downtown, not particularly just to the streetcar district. Uh, and we were talking about millions of dollars in new office construction, thousands of new residential units, thousands of new hotel units. Uh, thousands of jobs, and that uh, is obviously one of the most uh, fundamental, fundamentally appealing things about doing this project now, as opposed to, you know, waiting and doing it at a different phase. Um, uh, there's also substantial city revenues that come with it, and at a time when the city is hurting, we think a project that really brings new dollars to the city is a is a is a big win for everybody. So where will it go? Here's our locally preferred alternative, very catchy name for. With Metro approved, we went through an FTA alternatives analysis because we're hoping to ultimately qualify for FTA, Federal Transit Administration dollars, um, to help fund our construction costs. And this is the route that got approved earlier this year. Um, just to orient, the if, if you start at the sort of yeah. um, if you start at the, the sort of the top right corner, that's Broadway and First Street. We're going to go south all the way along Broadway to 11th Street. Okay. South along Broadway to 11th Street. It's going to make a right turn. Head over to Figueroa. Here's Chickern Court. So you're talking about Staples, LA Live, right in here. Uh, the hotels. Uh, heading up along Figueroa, past 8th and Fig. This is the developing shopping district. The grocery store is right here. Uh, making a right turn on 7th Street along Restaurant Row. 7th, as you may know, is undergoing a road dive because it's it's a, one of our great two-way streets in downtown. There's so many restaurants and, and other kinds of entertainment options here on 7th Street. Uh, our one left turn that we're making within the primary route is here on Hill Street and 7th. So we're going to head north up on Hill Street. Uh, and then right here at 1st, this is a little spur that we're planning that gets you over to Grand Avenue and down to hopefully first, uh, hopefully <coughs> second, possibly third street, Disney Concert Hall, MoCA, all the cultural venues are here. Um, I'll note that the council, men's, council member mentioned the um, Community Facilities District. The Community Facilities District is planned for this route here, 
It doesn't include the little spur on the Grand Avenue because these are private. These are all public properties that wouldn't be contributing to that uh, community facilities <coughs> district. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but just you may see some of the discourse that there's kind of two parts to the route, and that's the distinction between them. Just that little spur. The key to, to connectivity. So, I, I, if you're familiar enough with downtown, I think you understand why we, we made the route where we did. Um, we wanted to hit those destinations, and then of course we also wanted to hit the red line, the blue line, the expo line, all the buses on Broadway. Um, there was, of course, discussion about you know, do we can we get all the way to Union Station? And funding was an issue. If you try and get the route along here, you're going through a lot of public property, and again, you're dealing just like with Grand Avenue with properties that wouldn't contribute to the uh, construction costs of the project. So we opted to build what we could build and what the private sector was willing to get behind and put their dollars behind. Uh, as the council member mentioned, very high boarding numbers. If you look at what our projected boardings are, and you know we're using the same formulas as, as are used for every transit project, um, we compare favorably not only to every streetcar system that's been built or is currently under planning in the U.S. right now, um, we're showing higher average daily boardings per mile compared to any of the light rail systems that Metro's built compared to the Orange Line, um, you know, as, as measured to their actual ridership. And of course, Metro, every one of their systems keeps beating their projections. We think we're going to beat our projections as well. Uh, but that's what you get when you put a system into a very dense area. You've got lots of riders ready to go. So who pays for this thing? Uh, as mentioned, truly a public-private partnership. Um, the pie chart here is actually just showing construction costs. Operating these systems, comparable to, to a large measure to operating a bus system like DASH or something similar, but nonetheless, over 30 years, uh, the, the operations costs add up. We expect the operations will be handled by the public sector. We're working with the city and Metro to figure out exactly how that formula is gonna work. But the construction costs are proposed to be handled 50% by the private sector and 50% by the public sector. The 10%, this kind of bottom 10% here, it's primarily redevelopment dollars that are secured. There are the dollars we've been spending to help develop the project, get through environmental uh, review, get through our pre-engineering. The additional 40% that we're looking at here are FTA dollars, probably small starts program dollars. We think we're going to be very well positioned to go after those dollars based on all the criteria of our project. But to get, to, to get that 40%, we really need this 50%. We've got to leverage private funding and show that we have a local funding match to use to secure those federal dollars. So that private funding is what we call, here's a little discussion about the local match. Um, again, we've been in discussion with, with the uh, Federal uh, Transit Administration on our project for a couple of years. They know it well, and we know that they like us because of the ridership, because of the density, because of the land use, the economic development, um, and they want to see a local match. Uh, the local maps that we're proposing, very similar to what's in other cities. Here's just comparison. These are the Portland lines, um, Seattle, Tucson. Atlanta's a little misleading because their figure includes a lot of uh, dollars that are not just the, the streetcar dollars. If you were to back out the non-streetcar dollars, they end up being higher than 50% as well. So our match, we think, is very comparable. And actually, if you look at the more recent projects, Kansas City just passed one where the local funding is actually 75%, um, Oklahoma City as well. There are, all these cities are, are asking their private sector to come in at much higher percentages and frankly much higher dollars than what we're looking for from our, our local match. So what, we, what we're proposing to do is create a <coughs> facilities district, really an infrastructure taxing district that lets you tax the folks within essentially a three block three pedestrian blocks of the, of the line. Um, there are certain boundaries here just based on, for example, the freeway where you, there are physical barriers to getting around the property. But the idea is if you're within proximity to the line and your property is, is, has a very high likelihood of benefiting, you're gonna pay something towards uh, those construction costs. That tax will be collected over a 30 year period. It'll be bonded against to pay for the construction up front. Um, I'll mention a little later, it's, uh, well, I'll mention it now. Um, the timing of that payment, we have, the plan is to structure these bonds so that you're not going to start repayment until the project is almost out of construction, essentially. 
um, which means you're actually going to have something in the ground close to delivery, if not in delivery, before it shows up on your tax bill. Uh, and the formula that we use ultimately, as a reference here, it's based on parcel square footage. So it's the land area that you have. It doesn't matter what your land use is. It doesn't matter whether it's a vacant lot or a skyscraper. Um, you are, your rate is based simply on the amount of land area that you have. Um, and the reason for, one of the reasons for picking that formula is that it does incentivize additional development. We had looked at doing this based on building area with the notion that if you had a heavily built project, you were more easily able to accommodate an additional tax on your property. Um, but I think we realized, number one, it, it does disincentivize development, and it also penalizes those that have made major investments in downtown. So here's the basics. The, uh, under California law, it's the residents that are going to vote for this. Um, the residents are also going to be included amongst the properties that are taxed. That election is currently set for um, December 3rd. It's a mail-in ballot, which means people will get their ballots mailed to them in early November and have until December 3rd to either mail them back in or to bring them to City Hall. Uh, you are essentially eligible to vote if you live within the district itself, meaning if the building that you live in would be taxed, whether you're a condominium owner or simply an apartment dweller, uh, you are entitled to vote. Uh, and as mentioned, it will appear on the property tax bill on an annual basis. Um, uh, and, and we have looked at, obviously, in working with the commercial property owners, that they would have the ability to pass these on uh, in their commercial rents or, or in their uh, residential rents. The other thing that we did working with the private sector was ensure that we had some protections in place that nobody would ever have to pay this tax if we couldn't deliver the project. So that broke down into essentially three key contingencies. Uh, the first is that we clear environmental review. And I think you folks know um, in California, you're talking about the California Environmental Quality Act. But because we're going for federal dollars, we're, we'll also be going through a, nas a nas <coughs> national environmental policy act review process at the same time. Um, second, we had to have a 30-year operational plan. Essentially, we wanted to ensure that for as long as people would be paying the bonds, the public sector would be obligated to actually operate the project. Um, and then that last one, of course, is to secure the remainder of the construction funding. We're not going to tax people if there's a gap in getting the funding when we can't build the project. This gives you an example of what the typical rates would be. Now, we, we broke these out. These are not all necessarily condominium buildings, but they're giving an equivalent of what a, a resident would be paying um, just based on the area of their property and the size of their building, proximity to the line. And these are annual figures, by the way. I think we didn't put it up there, but um, you can see the most expensive ones are you know, a Ritz-Carlton residence owner. If you have a 1,000 square foot unit in Ritz-Carlton, first of all, good for you. Um, but it's $100 a year. And uh, you know when you look at what HOA fees are for downtown or other fees for associated with apartments, including parking fees, we think these fees are, are very attractive. When we've talked to residents about them, um, the, you know, everyone uses the term no-brainer. So a little bit about the timeline. Uh, we are going to be spending the next couple of months in a very intense campaign getting residents familiar with the project familiar with how it's going to be paid for and the fact that they need to show up and vote and really show their local stake in this project. Um, if we clear that hurdle by the end of the year, we're going to continue with our environmental review process through the end of next year, start the engineering uh, in 2013, hope to start building in 2014, and ideally start writing it in 2015. So with that, happy to take any questions. Can you just put the map back up just for reference? Yes. You, you said the residents, whether they're property owners or not, in the area will be voting on it. Now, did you say something about the non-resident property owners, too, being able to vote or not? Uh, I, I didn't specifically. So uh, commercial property owners do not vote on this. Um, this is like a park bond, school district bond. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's residents. I mean, it, it's registered voters that get to vote on, on this kind of a project. You do one other thing, one quickly. How are you going to get the, the people to move out of those former theaters, the, uh, the swap meets and the, uh, those, uh, I guess, the Spanish-speaking churches or whatever that's in there now? How are you going to get them to move out? 
Well, where uh, those are leases that the private owners of the theaters uh, have the right, and they're working with those, the uh, tenants then now. But what we've done is create a vision for bringing back Broadway. It's most, maybe just with the exception of one, of the owners of the theaters uh, have bought into. They've been part of this process. So when those uh, leases <coughs> expire, uh, they would like to put those theaters back to use as some type of, you know, uh, theater use again. Uh, I know the one at State, uh, there's a church there now. Uh, the lease is coming up soon, and some of the, the owner of that theater, for example, that have expressed that they want to put that theater back to use. So we obviously can't get them out. It's a private, you know, issue, but the theater owners are on board with our vision for the area to make it lively again and get, put those theaters back to theater use. It's actually one of the great things about the streetcar project is you know the, all those theaters were built without the parking standards that we have today because they were built at a time when there was a rich streetcar system. And one of the challenges in getting them occupied is how do you get lots of people there? Um, you can do for special events, but on a regular basis, it's very difficult because the parking around Broadway is not what it is in other parts of downtown or, or the city. The streetcar fixes that problem, and it does so far more economically than building just a whole big bunch of new parking garages, which you know. Transit Coalition folks would understand is perhaps not the highest and best use of downtown land. Sir? Yeah, I noticed you got the line all figured out. Where are you going to put the yards and shops? Great question. So uh, part of our environmental review will be to look at the maintenance facility. Um, because streetcars are a much more compact system, <coughs> the amount of land that you need for maintenance facilities and storage are, are substantially smaller. And we've identified some primary sites that are right off the route, all within a half mile, essentially, of the, the primary track. Um, and we have had you know, tentative conversations. We think there's interest in building facility. You can actually build these things and then build over them or build around them. Um, they don't take up uh, you know, blocks and blocks. We're really talking about, in, in our case, less than half a city block, essentially, um, to build uh, the, the full maintenance and storage facility. And they're pretty compatible with urban living too. They're not. There's not a lot of noise involved here um, in Portland and elsewhere. They're you know right in the middle of their downtowns. So, yeah. Have you done any polling yet about uh, uh, what the attitude of the uh, people who live in the district is yes. toward this? Uh, we have. We've done formal polling, and then you know we talk to people all the time. Yeah. And um, the, the polling has been very strong, especially when people get familiar with the project. I think there's a relatively high percentage of people that have a kind of a downtown use, recognize the word, but don't know what a streetcar is because, you know, we haven't had one in generations. I think when people get some sense of what the project is, the level of support is, is incredibly high. Our, po our polling shows that once we educate the voters, we will reach that uh, two-third mark that is required for this. And you're having a big outreach campaign, I Yeah, we're just about to launch it. I mean, we're waiting for folks to, you know, sort of come back from the summer but you're going to see a lot of outreach within downtown. Okay. And just one other question about that. The spur line, I'm a little confused about that. Is that part of the original project, the one down Grand, or how is that going to operate? Yeah, so the, the, the hope is that we'll build the entire project all at one time. We simply don't have identified local funding for that particular part of the project. So, you know, we, we want that distinction to be clear because from, again, from LA Streetcar Inc., the private sector standpoint, we didn't think it was fair to have property owners in the rest of downtown paying for an area that didn't have, that wasn't making a private sector contribution to it. Um, candidly, there's all kinds of ideas about how we would come up with that private funding. Eli hasn't offered it. The, there's, there, there, you know, people talk about benefactors and naming rights, and um, there, there, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities to look at it. You know, if you look at kind of the route overall, there are some engineering challenges there. You're making a left turn. Grand Avenue is a lot of great, great Upper Grand Avenue is actually a bridge. So it, it is more complicated, and we didn't want to hold up the rest of the project till we figured that part of it out. But we think once we have the momentum, I mean, I've been a Bunker Hill stakeholder for, you know, since I've been in Los Angeles. I would love to see that built at the same time. Well, let's put it this way. We're in conversations of interested people that you mentioned. <laughs> no names. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when you were talking about the, uh, uh, the CFD, you showed um, annual rates for uh, tenants of condos and apartments, will tenants of commercial properties as well, I mean, will yeah. those be included in the assessment as well? Yeah, so the way it works, and, and these are, um, first of all, these are all estimates, they're based on bond rates, and okay. to be, be clear, they're, they're conservative. 
Uh, I think these numbers are based on a 5% bond rate. If we were to float the bond now, it would be under 4%. So the number would drop substantially. Um, some of these are condominiums. The Ritz-Carlton residence, that's a condo. You'll, you'll see this number on your property tax bill. Mm -hmm. If you're an apartment dweller, you don't get a property tax bill. Your landlord does. And then your landlord passes it on however they choose to. Now, if you kind of look at what the absorption rates are in, in downtown for rents, and you look at what's been happening in downtown rents, downtown rents are increasing. The, the dollars that we're talking about here, I mean, you know, 10 or $12 or less. Um, uh, I think the average number for all downtown is $60 or less, even at that 5% rate per year. So, you know, will there be a rent impact? Sure, but we think there'll be a rent impact, frankly, within the, the downtown market regardless. We think it's going to be easy to absorb. We have a lot of residential property owners that are either on our board or have been in contact with us as we've been developing this, as well as commercial property owners, you know, office uh, office landlords. Um, and uh, I think they understand that uh, you know this is really yes, it's a tax, but it's also it's a shared investment in downtown, right? It, it gets somebody a system that nobody could really build on their own. But to answer your question, yes, commercial property will also be assessed as well. And so the large commercial property owners will have a bigger assessment and than this. We've got the support of most of the large property owners now, that we've been doing that for two years now. We've actually taken them up to Portland to see the benefits of the streetcar. So we've been doing an advocacy campaign, uh, an informal one, with a lot of the large property owners. And most of them, not all, have come on board. Support uh, AG for one of the largest property owners on this route fully support it. They see the benefits of this. <coughs> I think they're the largest actually, and they've, they've been on the board and supportive. Will the commercial property owners, like the residential property owners, be able to pass through the tax to the tenant yes. of their building? Yeah. Okay. I mean, unless they have something in their lease that prevents them, but there, there's nothing about the, the the tax as a legal thing that prevents them from doing that. Okay. Sir? A uh, couple questions. Uh, first of all, your map showed a dotted line going along 9th Street. Uh, sure. And uh, you did, uh, if you would explain that. And the other question you spoke about uh, the parking issue with old Broadway versus uh, today's Broadway. Well, if people are going to join that line, they're going to have to park somewhere. And where would that be? Sure. Um, both great questions. So just to, to start with the dotted line, um, so if you look along 9th and then it, it goes up to Hill, that's essentially an operational alternative. Um, when we were when we were going through our FTA alternatives analysis, we didn't do a full blown traffic study like you would do in an EIR kind of a process. So we had to identify some feasible routes and look for things that were possibilities. Uh, Ninth was proposed in case Seventh Street ended up having too many impacts. From what we can tell after a further review, we think Seventh Street is going to work. Seventh Street is obviously preferred, just given what's on it. Um, it's a little tough to see, but you can see there's a dash line actually seven continuing over to, to Hill from Broadway. So you could theoretically have two separate loops that operate for operational reasons. So for some reason, you know, people only wanted to do half the route or you wanted to make it easy to circulate, you could sort of break them up. But that's an operational issue. And the parking issue. So the, the parking issue is, first of all, there's, there are very different um, uh, amounts of parking in different parts of downtown. There's no question that we are going to be um, making it much easier for folks once they park anywhere in downtown to get to other parts of downtown. And um, we've had a lot of input from parking lot operators. Uh, they had some concerns about you know, the project because some of them are among the largest landowners in downtown. Um, ultimately, we had them come and support our project. And, and um, you know, we think this project makes it easier for somebody to come and park the car anywhere and move around. So that's a good thing for parking lots. Sir, back home? Yes, if I'm coming from Pasadena with my friends on this road, where, how would we get to that, to that line? So if you come in, uh, goal line. Right. right. Okay, but, goal but, goal line. but wait, 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 wait. I know the goal line, but I want to get to Figueroa. I want to get to, to explain to me how I would use this. I want to spend the day. I want to be above ground. I want to. I want to see the. How would I get there? Sure. So. The, the immediate term answer is um, you would probably use a dash bus that would get you over there. The longer term answer is the regional connector. One of the reasons we didn't do our project, um, well, among the, the cost issues as well, but the regional connector, which you can see is the dashed kind of dark gray black line that goes all the way to, to Union Station, we didn't want to replicate an existing or a planned transit line. 
You don't need the dash line if you've got the red line right there. And the purple line, yeah. That's true. Take that's right. Yeah, the red line. By the way, no, 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 no. I want to be above ground. Above ground, okay. You have to participate in, in okay. the activities yeah. around that. Yeah. yeah, I think dash is the way to go. Am I wrong, or do you show the gold line being on Central rather than Alameda? Yeah. It does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I think it goes on Alameda instead of Central. Yeah, it does. There's San Pedro. Yep, you it's always like it's on Central, not Alameda. It's only a block away, but it's still not on Central. I got to check. I didn't draw the map. <laughs> uh, it's only a block it's difference. Flagging. It's yeah. only a block difference. But yeah. 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 Thanks for flagging. Yeah. We got to check that. Yeah. A lot of hands. A lot of hands. Yes. Okay. Um, I think when they were knocking around the alternatives, one of the concerns was crossing the blue slash expo line <coughs> grade. Right. So at this point, you're only, you know, if I'm reading this right, seven. It's already blue and expo's underground at that point. So exactly. the only crossing is going to be at 11. By 11th yes. Street, it's submerged. No, 11th Street, your line crossing Blue Expo right. at 11, you're going to be crossing a grade. Uh, but, uh, but by 11th Street, the Expo line is subterranean. That's why Pico was dropped. Yeah. No, no. Um, it's underground. No, 11th, no, that's not. 11th that, that's the portal. That's the portal of the Blue and Expo line. Right. Yeah. There's the portal up at like 9 no. or 10? No. No. It's not all the way down at 11. Yes. It is. It is. That's chick -run, that's chick -run. It comes at grade at 12. Yeah, it's, it's about a, just a block kind of yeah. south of there. Between the, the above grade stop is actually a block and a half below that map. And then it goes underground. Mm -hmm. It's between 11th and 12th. Yeah. Yeah. Sir? Yeah. You answered my first question. You need a two thirds above to right. pass it. Mm -hmm. And also, on the, on the streetcar running in the third lane, is it subject to all the traffic and bus parking? And and all that, or is it going to be somewhat of a open lane where it can actually be uh, planned progress? Sure, so um, <clears throat> I think the answer is even if this project never happened, Metro needs to make some operational efficiencies on the way buses <coughs> operate. I think this project is going to accelerate that because, for example, if you, if you go on Broadway now, there are so many different bus stops and so many different bus lines, and everyone seems to have their own stop all along Broadway. Um, this is an opportunity to consolidate those, to create real stops as opposed to just a signpost, you know, 10 places down the block. And I think once you do that, and Broadway itself is going on a, uh, is going through a streetscape and a, and, a, and a program to really look at it as a pedestrian friendly street with bump outs and curb cuts and things that allow people to actually use it as a pedestrian street. I mean, once you do that, you can have a much better operational um, flow, essentially, uh, without cars are leaving in yeah, As part of the Bringing Back Broadway initiative, we've actually adopted a master plan for the streetscape and we've gone through environmental, we're coordinating that with the needs of the streetcar. So we'll have more bump outs. We're actually going to extend the sidewalks um, and have more bump outs yeah, for the streetcar and bus systems and everything else to do. Yeah, you know, what makes traffic such a nightmare where you have a lot of those buses is that they're constantly weaving in and out. And I think by using those bump outs and you keep the streetcar and buses on a straight line, you know, you don't, you avoid that issue essentially. Sir? Can you explain some of that, the impetus behind the project? I mean, what what council action was acquired? Uh, how was LA Streetcar formed? What were the involvement between the community or the residential organizations yeah. and business owners? And this, I could say, happened independently of the city, really. I mean, it just so happened that I, as a council member, took interest that I dedicated a staff member, full-time staff member, to this and to the Bringing Back Broadway initiative. But it could have really come from anywhere. I mean, there was already those conversations, and we just kind of, the city or my office acted, and the Bringing Back Broadway initiative acted at the Calvary to bring everyone together, and everybody there then just kind of just went off with it. But it didn't need a real council, city council action. It's almost like they just come to us right now for the CFD, eventually for the rights of way or other things we have to do with sidewalk extensions, but those can or cannot happen even without the, the city. So really it's independent of the city. Where the city really comes in is the operation. Now what role will the city play in that? Is it going to be a partnership with Metro? Is it just going to be Metro? We're still working out those details. Uh, we know this though, that um, Metro uh,
to, to this day, it, it has only supported the streetcar to the extent that it had, we, I, as a board member, I put it in the Long Reach Development Plan, so it's part of its overall uh, inventory and uh, portfolio and new, new projects. Um, but in the future, um, it seems like for funding purposes, a majority of it is going to come from the city. That's the direction of going. Uh, Metro has only uh, provided us administrative support with the EIR. Uh, so for the future, the city is going to play a very significant role, and it kind of gave the ability to do the CFD. It's required by law, but it had to play a very minimal role in terms of official action. It's really stakeholders that make this happen, the nonprofit that we set up. Once we did that, it started rolling from there, and they just came to the city for the CFD, and that's it. But like I said, in the future, the city will play a very significant role. So the city will operate it, or Metro will operate it? We don't know yet. And I don't want to go on a publication. We still have a lot of negotiation to do. We're negotiating, but let me say this. We've had some very good conversations at high levels that I think some, some good partnership will develop out of this. You know, if the Salt Lake cities of the world can figure it out, we should be able to figure it out. <laughs> sure. You know, I'm kind of concerned because I know the drivers in LA are kind of aggressive. It's not exactly Portland, and I can see there's a possibility of you know, collisions between the streetcars and the autos. So in order to handle that, is there a thought of perhaps uh, limiting vehicular traffic where the streetcars are or educate people or something? I think it, I, I mean I think education is the way to go as opposed to limiting. Um, and the reality is, you know, driver behavior changes based on what what uses the streets. When I moved to downtown, there were so few pedestrians that you know you jaywalk at your peril. You know, um, about two years ago, LAPD upped the, the jaywalking fines because traffic had slowed down and there were so many more pedestrians that there was a lot more jaywalking that was going on. Um, it will take education, uh, but streetcars don't move like light rail. Um, streetcars, you know, are, um, there's a driver in the vehicle who can see if there's an obstacle, you hit the brakes and that's it. If you look at the safety records in places like Portland, where, I mean, Portland people just walk in front of a booming streetcar, um, yeah, their, their safety records are very, very impressive and, and education does have a lot to do with it. Um, my name is Ronaldo. I'm a student at uh, LA Valley College. Uh, Cynthia, By the way, uh, since you're the last one to walk in, you get to buy us dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I just came in because I'm trying to add classes there, so I just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I want to know about the uh, the, the streetcars. Is it going to be in the middle, or is it going to be side by side where the buses are going to be stopping at? So it's going to run along the curb. So the tracks will run right along the curb lane, essentially. So when buses pull over to let people on and off, they'll be in that same lane. Otherwise, obviously, the buses can go in whatever lane. And uh, how is uh, the station design going to be like? Or is it just going to be like just like the buses stop? Just... I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. Uh, they're not really stations because streetcars, because the speed in which they operate, you know, you, you might have a, a stop every block or block and a half. Uh, that's about what we're predicting right now. So you, you wouldn't have a large, you know, uh, stop in the sense of like a light rail stop uh, or station like you have a light rail station. But we do want to have um, informative kiosks that have, for example, real-time information that tells you when the next train is coming, you know, where you are in the loop and, and, and things like that. So. Again, we're hoping it's an opportunity to sort of consolidate some of that information, put those informational signs together, and have stops that are higher quality, that have a, a branding, so you understand that that's the streetcar system that you're looking at. Yeah, do you know, sorry, like, uh, do you know, in the new future when it's completed, do you know at least the fare, at least how much is going to be? We don't know the fare. Um, you know, we hear everybody would love to ride for free. Who doesn't want to ride for free? Having said that, uh, what's important to us is actually integrating it into the other systems, right? And so if we want it well integrated into Metro system and Dash and other things, we're going to have to have a fare that's compatible with those to ensure that you can circulate amongst the systems. You probably know that, this one probably knows better than anybody, that right now transferring between Metro's own systems, let alone Metro <coughs> Dash or anything else, doesn't work very well. But Metro's trying to improve that. We're hoping that we'll build on that so by the time we're operating, there is a, I'd love to see one tap card that works for everything. Yeah. 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 Sir? Yeah. Uh, have you figured out an operational schedule? How many cars an hour? And also how many days per week and all that yeah. sort of thing? That sort of leads into Craig Jr.'s <coughs> question about the yards and how you're going to get cars pulled in and out. Just looking at your map, 
Part he had, he had laser in, that's not a question. I, I got the question, but I just right, it's like the old W let, line let the in the old TL days. But uh, again, the schedule. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we, what we have estimated, and you know, our cost projections and things are based on operating 18 hours a day, seven days a week. So we want to operate from essentially early morning to relatively late at night. We know people would love for us to go till 3 a.m. after the last call. I don't think we're going to get there on day one. Um, but certainly it's a robust schedule. We're not going to stop at 7 the way Dash does. We expect that people are going to use the system into late in the evenings for entertainment uses. Um, in terms of the number of cars on the system, we're looking at headways of roughly 5 to 7 minutes during peak hours, dropping to 12-ish minutes, something around there, for off-peak. For off so we'll accommodate the number of cars that we days need to do that. Week? Seven days a week. Okay. I don't know about the holidays, but no. We're planning on operating all year long. Uh, two quick sort of unrelated questions, but the first one is if the, I think it's a great idea, you know, I worked in Bunker Hill uh, before I went to school and I, I would love to see this implemented. So I, I sure hope that CFD passes, but in the event that it does not pass, have you, have, do you have plan B for, for funding or what, what is your plan if that doesn't pass? We're collecting donations tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there certainly are other alternative ways to, to get there, but what we're doing with our CFD or our local match is what's been done in the vast majority of cities. Okay. And you know, for those who follow federal transit funding, um, you know, trans transportation projects generally, transit projects especially, not freeway projects are a little different, but transit projects are um, always require local subsidy. They have for you know decades. Um, so if if the CFD doesn't work, I mean, frankly, it's a huge setback for the project. There's no other way to say it. Okay. Um, but we would be looking for another private funding source, uh, however that would work. Well, my other, uh, Jessica Weddington, my executive, my executive director for Bringing Back Broadway, her answer to that question is, it's dead. Um, but really, it's a huge setback. Okay. It's a huge I'm delay. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that we would have to wait a couple of years to come back for another CFD and do a better job of trying to educate people about the benefits. That's what I think. I, that's probably one of the first things that we would discuss. So as a, as a person who is ineligible to vote in that election, I don't live in downtown LA, what can you know, advocates like us do between now and that election day to you know, help get this thing passed? That's a great, I feel like I planned for that question, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, there, there are going to be a number of outreach events. They're, they're going to be targeted to downtown folks, but I think we're looking for endorsements from folks, from organizations and individuals. Um, there are going to be, I think, at least one event and possibly more that's open to the more general public because, um, as mentioned, you know, Pasadena and, and other places, we know that there's a lot of interest in streetcars all around the city, not just in downtown. Mm -hmm. And we certainly want to capture that. We want the support. We want, to, we want people to help us build our project, and then we want to help other people build their project. I, I'll say it is the hardest project I've worked on, um, especially for the dollar value of the project relative to other, other projects. Um, because we're first, you know, and we're fighting battles that haven't been fought for 80 years. And there wasn't the California Environmental Quality Act when they put these in the first time. So there's a lot we can offer to people that want to well, join. Endorsements from organizations, from people help. But even what's more important, if you have your time to volunteer, let us know. Go to the website, um, LA Streetcar. Actually, we have a new streetcar. We have a new website, streetcar.la. Um, just focused on the, um, essentially the, the average. And if, what is it? Street Streetcar. Okay. And uh, send your information if you have time to volunteer. We are um, going to different uh, condos, etc., and having people drop things off or talk to people. We have we're setting up tables at different community events. People want to volunteer their time. That's even even better. Does this project ever have been brought in uh, Measure R? Uh, it was not in the original Measure R. Um, to be candid, just if you look at the size of the project, uh, we don't really fit as a regional project. I mean, Councilmember can address this better, but we're a hundred million, hundred fifty million dollar project. The Metro R projects are a lot well, bigger. To, as, to speak more bluntly, Metro hasn't been fully supportive. Uh, the Metro ha hasn't fully understood this. When I wanted to put this on the long range development plan, uh, people ask me, "Oh, you're going to paint the bus red?" <laughs> and still have it rubber wheels. No, no, this is a rail system, this can have rail, etc. So, Metro wasn't really fully supportive, so by the time Measure I was coming about, I don't think there was a political support. Now, there was another 
part of the measure are the local return at the local city level. Even there, when I advocated for it, the city, each city council or each region gets local return money in Measure R. Uh, it's more discretionary dollars to support uh, transportation at the uh, city level. Uh, when I advocated for their council members were kind of like, what is it? We really didn't fully understand it. Politically, the support wasn't there to get Measure R dollars, but who knows in the future. So, so yeah, well, I'm right behind you. you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, another question about the curb lane. You pointed out earlier in the talk that the um, tracks would share the curb lane with bicyclists. And uh, I'm sure that Portland has had to address that issue given their support for both modes of transportation. And I was wondering, it's kind of a technical question. Um, one of the greatest dangers for bicyclists are railroad tracks uh, because the tire goes down there and away you go. Especially when it's raining. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can slide into it. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, there's been any thought of using the sort of uh, track lane technology that prevents that from happening? Um, yeah, we're definitely looking at the most you know, recent advances in, in track technology. I can tell you that even the, the tracks that are laid in Portland, for example, it's a lot shallower and, and uh, the rails aren't nearly, the, the cavity for the rails is not as big as it is for light rail and, and other systems, so it's not as bad, but we get that. That's a real issue for bikes. Um, I think you know, the answer is, first of all, we've already talked to DOT about this. Obviously, they've seen our route. They know where they want to do their bike lanes. Every other city does it. I mean, if you want to be a city that truly offers multimodality, you have to learn to accommodate the different modalities on the streets that are not just intended to be freeways. You know, um, we think we're going to get there, but we certainly appreciate the feedback from from bicyclists about how to best integrate the systems. Well, that's, a, that's a very good point. And uh, as we, there's different technologies that are being used, and uh, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I think we will take that into account as we're looking at how to do it. So, has uh, thought been given to closing off parts of Broadway entirely, like uh, such as the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica? So, well, Council Member, I have thoughts on this. Just from streetcar standpoint, um, it. So, it would only the only yeah. uh, the only vehicle would be the streetcar. Sure. I mean, th there there are a few places that have tried that. We're not trying to be the Grove, right? Uh, <laughs> this is a circulator <laughs> system. Even if you close a particular section of it, you know, we would certainly have traffic all over the place. I think the, the idea of doing a promenade is really separate from what the streetcar circulator project will be. Well, uh, Rick Caruso is a huge supporter and he was, he's helped fund us uh, for the nonprofit. And he said, I love streetcars. I built one at the Grove, but the problem is mine goes nowhere. <laughs> so, um, but I, I brought it, there's, there's a difference of opinion. Uh, to be quite frank, whether we could shift down Broadway. Um, and so, I don't know, Russ, what do you think? Uh, you know. <laughs> if you look at Old Town Pasadena or Third Street Promenade, you know, they've been successful because they basically have parallel streets that have entrances and parking garages, and it was built in a different environment than Broadway is. On Broadway, we have alleys that aren't really useful alleys for entering and exiting. Um, and some of the property owners uh, have property in Melbourne that has a streetcar and they love the fact that it's more of a pedestrian environment. And when we were in Portland, it actually goes right through Portland University. People are sitting five feet from the streetcar having coffee and they don't even flinch because the streetcar comes through so quietly. Um, I think we've made a good balance on the Broadway streetscape to take two lanes of traffic out to widen the sidewalks to uh, shift most of the through traffic that goes through Broadway that isn't really for Broadway onto other streets and try to create some kind of balance. There wouldn't be anything that would stop Broadway for maybe special events or the evenings or the weekends to be closed for you know, the farmer's market like they do on Sunday now or Fiesta Broadway. So, but we're not really working towards shutting the whole down, the whole Broadway down for 12 blocks because you would block many of the entrances and exits to the building. So it is very much of a balancing act. Just one thing, somebody was talking about the theaters. Um, there's, what, 13 theaters. What most people don't realize is four of the theaters are owned by one family, the Delajani family. The Los Angeles, the state, the tower, and the, uh, oh, the, uh, the Los Angeles, uh, what was the palace. the palace? The palace was just renovated. Um, 
Younger family members have now taken those over, and so they're moving more aggressively to get those up and running. The Million Dollar Theater has been renovated. The Orpheum has been very much finished and up. Um, the UA Theater just was sold, and it's going to become the Ace Hotel. So you've got six, seven theaters there ready to go. When you add in the Belasco and the Mayan, just a block away, you could see you could start to have eight, nine, ten theaters connected by streetcar with 10,000 people in those theaters on a given night, being able to be moved around fairly quickly. And when you add the convention center and 75,000 people at the stadium to be able to get in and out, it really makes the perfect sense to start circulating a lot of people. We're going to need to buy more cars. Uh, Bart, how are we doing for time? Because I, I know well, you have other things on your agenda. So. Actually, uh, sort of the subject is as long as there's questions okay. and um, we'll, we'll, we'll go for another 10 minutes of this. Okay. I did want to say, you know, I, I saw somewhere that this was listed as the secrets of the downtown streetcar. And, um, <laughs> I, and, and I don't know where that came from because we feel like we're an open book. Yeah. Um, so let, let, me, just, let me explain this. When we market our meetings, if I just said downtown streetcar, I'd have 10 people here. I, I, I have one of my speakers here who had one of the biggest attendances we ever had. I think it was six people. So we like, you know, there's an old saying on the radio, nobody likes to eat at an empty restaurant. I like this room full, so if there were secrets, even if there were no secrets, we have a full room. So that's what really counts. I get you. The, the ad guys win the day. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll just point out, if, you, if uh, you don't get your questions answered, you think of other things, uh, you can certainly go to the website, streetcar.la. Uh, actually, for you folks, the, the old uh, website, it's the old one, LA Streetcar, go LA streetcar.org is still up. That actually has more kind of transit level detail. Streetcar.la is much more focused on the CFD issues. But, sir. Yeah, just one quick comment and then a question. Uh, on Broadway, you have currently, I believe, about 180 buses an hour in each direction during peak. And about 70% of the people on Broadway get there by bus. Yeah. And the hourly ridership is higher than the daily ridership we were talking about. Uh, and if you look at the geography, unfortunately, because of the hills, etc., it's difficult to find another street to put those buses on. Uh, however, if you want to make it buses and streetcars. But my question uh, is, what would be the impact on dash service, and if there would be a reduction of some of the dash service in the downtown, would there be a cost savings that could be utilized? Sure. So really quickly on the bus question, um, there are a huge number of buses on Broadway, no, no doubt about it. The majority are going northbound, and we're going southbound. Um, some of the southbound, we think, probably will, you know, could get moved to other streets that are, that are nearby, Spring Street, for example. Um, in terms of DASH service, uh, we think DASH will likely get uh, maybe rerouted or, or reworked to you know, uh, avoid redundancies, essentially. But certainly the hope is not to eliminate DASH. I mean, I, you know, I, I use DASH and, and, and have always used it. And I think as a, as a, we need more than one circulator downtown. You know, we, we need that system. But it, should, it certainly should be optimized in a way that works with um, the streetcar. Two points on the bus issue, um, just a quick point that what we learned in Portland is that generally speaking, uh, and just uh, generally speaking, there's a certain demographic that would uh, use a bus and there's a certain demographic, generally speaking, that wouldn't use a bus, but everybody would use a streetcar. That's what we found in Portland, that people of all income levels feel comfortable riding a streetcar. We're generally here. You know, it, it is a uh, majority low income people who use bus systems. And so we predict that given that what they saw in Portland, um, some people would use the streetcar uh, more so than, than the bus. But that's just uh, generally speaking. Secondly, on the dash, dash is, su is successful from our point of view in the city. We don't have more lines because of funding. And we certainly don't want to cut any lines. We will readjust them to after we see the ridership and how we will adjust them. But um, one of my challenges will be to keep as many dash lines as I could in downtown, but just to realign them and not cut them. Uh, we, we could use a lot more dash systems. We just don't have the funding. How's that corner? All right, so I have two questions. Um, first off, um, I noticed in the videos and the stills you showed, 
the, the streetcar that you have on the tracks looks very much like a United Streetcar. Uh, and United Streetcar is an American company which is great, but they're in Portland, which is not so great. Um, where, so, uh, whereas we have in Chatsworth, TIGS who also makes streetcars. Um, so who are we giving the con or who are we talking to about giving that contract to? That's the first question. And then the second question, which is somewhat related since it's also about Portland, is uh, it was mentioned that um, the biggest stop on the Portland system is their university. Are there any colleges or universities on this route? And sure. if, if not, why not? Um, so on, on second half, uh, FIDM is there. Um, you know, in and around downtown, there, there are some schools. There's, there are frankly not a whole lot of schools. Uh, certainly as an expansion, as a natural expansion, we would love to get down to USC, hit LA Trade Tech, um, get over to Cy Arc, yeah, the Arts District. So, you know, it, we have, I think we're plotting around lots of major destinations within downtown as it is. We frankly have a lot higher density than Portland will have, you know, even 20 years into the future. Um, your first question was, Oh, oh the, where will they be built? Okay, so we're, we're not anywhere near contracting out for these things. Uh, the renderings were based on, you know, a, a prototypical streetcar model. Um, certainly the hope is that, you know, at the point at which we're acquiring cars, we, we want to keep the dollars as local as we can, even for, I mean, there are European manufacturers that do car production and assembly in the U.S. And, and it, you know, to the extent that we have the ability to, to bring jobs here for the manufacturer side, I think we're going to make efforts to do that, but we're not there yet. I mean, let's just be clear. That's a rendering. It's it's used so you can go ooh and ah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, Councilmember Mitch Englund did uh, from the chat work area reminded me that there's a LA-based streetcar manufacturer, and the procurement. I'm just predicting right now. We haven't gotten to that point. We haven't even started thinking about that. I would assume at this point there would probably be an MTA procurement. Uh, I'm just guessing right now, and they have their own rules that they follow, etc. But uh, locally preferred, LA built, why not? I mean, that should get some points. Um, well, not if you're taking federal money. Yeah, yeah. we have to look at the yeah, I know. We, We've got to balance Buy America and local preference and all that. So we're not there yet. This, is, this should have been the second part of my other question. So now that, and I still, I still thought the portal was a different spot. So I'm assuming the reason you chose 11 was to avoid an aggregate crossing. Just is yes. it see, I mean, how many, I don't know many other places in California would have that type of crossing? You, you would have had a hard time getting that approved by the CPC. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Even though in Oregon, there, Shiraz, there is another map that's a bigger view that shows the station just south of there. Can I add here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think there's one. Okay. Well, okay. I guess I have a question about the operating funding because you've talked about not getting cash, but if the city of LA is going to pay, I don't know, four million after 20 percent fare box recovery, how are they going to pay the four million with the city's budget deficit and not cutting existing transportation? Yeah, I mean, to be candid, we're in the process of working those out. I would say, as the council member said, uh, the feedback from the city has been very positive. There, there are dollars available. We're, we're going to be generating a lot of new revenues for the city, and I think the city has got to essentially look at, you know, so much of the discussion about the city budget over the last few years, I'm just on my soapbox here, but it's, it's all been about the cut side. Um, I think the city is now looking at what do we do on the revenue side, how do we grow things. This project is just one example of doing that, and I think there's a lot of interest in figuring out, you know, how do we, how do we take the growth capture and, and return that into the project. Yeah, you're correct. Um, we're, the dollars will be competing with each other, that's just a fact, uh, but those things have yet to be worked out. Um, my point was, at least for the downtown area, not to use funding for dash that's going into the downtown area. We don't want to lessen any service just because the streetcar came in. But those dollars will be competing for each other, um, that's a fact. But we're also looking at, uh, looking at different revenue sources that we hadn't looked at before in the past to use for transportation operations, including dash. So we're trying to expand the pie. Uh, measure R being some of those um, dollars that we haven't used it for construction, but we possibly could use it for operations. Yeah, okay. Well, like you said, LA is way more dense than Portland. I mean, you already said yourself that there's going to be a lot more ridership. Now, I know you, you don't know much information about streetcars themselves, but 
what have you thought about you know larger? Would they be larger than the Portland? Like on the sets of like a European the physical tram? vehicle? Yeah, the actual vehicle. Would they be like on the sets of like a European tram? I mean, actually, what a lot of the European systems, their tram systems are essentially streetcar systems. They're, they're not particularly different. Some of them, in Europe, they do tend to have longer vehicles. They'll have articulated vehicles. Um, you know, I think we're going to have to look at really what our ridership projections are and how well our streets accommodate them. You know, the longer the vehicle, the tougher some of the curves and things are. There's a balance to be struck. What the maintenance facility you find will also be... The company growth? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll come back and then I'll... Okay. Um, so, well, I could... Well, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you mentioned that you want to protect the dash systems within downtown LA, but what about the dash systems in, say, the San Fernando Valley um, or some of the other areas? Because, you know, from my perspective, downtown LA has a pretty good when it comes to transit. Um, and we can use some of that transit out there in the valley. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm sure the council member is saying that. I'll, I'll just make this point about our transit within downtown. Um, so, I think a good comparison, if you look at Los Angeles to other other cities, is London. Um, London is also a city that has not sort of one real core center. It's a fairly distributed city. It's also a fairly low-rise city. Um, there, there's a lot of similarities. And if you look at a similar area within similar geographic area for downtown LA, and overlaid it on London. London has 80 transit stops in the same area that we have, that we will have 12 when we build them out. There's a lot of room for new transit in downtown. Well, let me put it this way. Just because the streetcar comes in doesn't mean we should lose dash service. What I'm saying is we will realign the routes, but we would not lose dash service. That's for downtown. That's, we're not, I'm not looking, it's not going to directly impact that for now. My concern is that, you know, the downtown dashes, and that punch it, you kind of got somewhere that comes out from the, the farther out areas. We don't, yeah, we don't know that yet. Yeah, so. Downtown never gets those preferences from my standpoint. I was just wondering, I didn't see any particular stops. I mean, it was kind of like the solid green line pretty much. What kind of priority do you have in advance for interacting with the Angel's Flight when you're on Hill Street? Is there any priority on that? We'll be across the street from, from Angel's Flight. I mean, Angel's Flight is somewhat of a <coughs> unique system, obviously, and it's historic. It has its own operational challenges. Um, we're certainly not intersecting with them. I mean, we're going to be across the street, so anybody can you know, get off on, on right there, Grand Central Market, take the system up, up the hill and go you know, to Bunker Hill or down. Um, but it's a, you know, they, they don't interlink. I mean, it's a funicular car. That would be a very logical stop. It would be very yeah. logical. I would yeah, yeah, we certainly expect there will be a stop within a block. I mean, leaving into a slight aside, Grand Central Market's there, which is a huge attraction as well. We just have to make it work operationally. So. Well, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. I do want to introduce you to Sarah Hernandez. She's my downtown district director. If any of you just have other general downtown issues, I'm not follow up with bringing back Broadway. Yeah, have Russ here, who's an expert in it. Um, Jessica went into things out of town, my executive director, but Sarah Hernandez is also got contact for any other issues in downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting's only going to go on for about 15 more minutes.